Okay, I think we're good. Let's start streaming. Nice, we think we are live. Yep, and we are live. Hello, everyone. Surprise, surprise, I'm actually not 10 minutes late. I'm in fact three minutes early. How are we today? Hello to the notification squad, which should be appearing any moment now. Uh, of course, this was a completely unannounced video, so I don't expect a large crowd tonight. But hey, if you're free and you're chilling, then join me. So while we are waiting for the official start time, um, hello to Brett Aqua Blue and nice username. Nice username and Shalasa. It's the usual crowd. Hello, everyone. So I've got a few uh, things to talk about in this video. This is not a Q and A video. This is a reflections video. We'll take Q and A a bit later, though, because uh, I'd like doing this every now and then. Uh, for those who are just joining me, I normally do a reflections video after every uh, competition or event that I, I that I participate in. Um, I haven't been in an event recently, but. I have been doing club shoots and um, there's been a few things I've learned over the past three or four weeks which I want to talk about and share which the uh, video title may already hint towards. There are a few interesting things which I didn't want to, I mean I want to make a video about this topic at some point uh, but uh, I kind of want to mention here first as an initial thing. So hello to everybody, hello to Arnis, uh, welcome back again. The archery juice, I'm glad you asked, I was going to mention it, it's just plain orange juice. Um, not, not, nothing too special, just plain orange juice, get a little craving for that citrus. Um, hello David Wood, hello Aqua Blue, what is your favourite kind of bow? At the moment I'm really liking the Mongolian bow, that's been the most fun bow to shoot. Uh, I've got some new long bows to play around with. Uh, but I'm really liking that um, that Mongolian bow. Hello to Z the Sakura plays Minecraft from the Philippines, uh, and random vid exclamation mark exclamation mark and Rocket Fist, one of my favourite uh, regulars uh, on the stream. Hello. So, uh, oh hey, Jordy Skate Fletching Veins. What a great thing to like do fletchings and watch live videos at the same time. Very um, you know re uh, re relaxing and you know, therapeutic to uh, do veins. But unfortunately, I have one less arrow to fletch. I, I have unfortunately lost an X10. Um, I I'm hopeful that I can find it next time I search the field. But uh, I did lose an X10. I'll mention it a bit later. Um, for those that don't know, the uh, Eastern X10s are perhaps the most uh, expensive student, uh, no, m most expensive arrow. Sorry, I was reading the chat there. Um, yes, uh, an X10 uh, probably costs more than the annual GDP of um, you know Samoa or something. <laughs> it's uh, it's not exactly a, a pleasant thing to lose. If you lose like an Eastern Apollo or a Carbon One. That's okay. I break my wooden arrows all the time. I don't care. They're like 10 bucks each. Eastern X10s are like five times as much. And um, I want to find it. So, yuck. Yes. So, it's not pleasant. But it does happen. I've got some spares. Plus one I haven't cut yet. So, I've got enough to last. But, uh, yeah. Ouch. That's one arrow you do not want to throw away. Okay. So, uh, just while we're waiting... Oh, actually, it is 11.30 now. So, um, we have we can officially start. I just want to bring up something which I think is really funny, all right? So, for those who've been following uh, my Facebook page and pretty much everyone else's Facebook page on archery, you may be aware of a certain uh, topped archery YouTube channel list um, made by, uh, I think, Feedpost. And this has been the worst list that's ever been compiled and um i know some of you i think most of you've already seen this list but i'll show it to you because this is absolutely hilarious so what this is uh this is basically an aggregate marketing site so it's a blog which collates raw search data from google or whatever and it makes a, a fairly arbitrary list of top channels or top blogs for whatever topic it might be uh, Mumbai uh, food blogs or um, uh, uh, chiropractic um, channels whatever it's weird as and uh, the main archery one and, and, and the weird thing is that for the other topics they've got a fairly small kind of uh, topic but 
archery is very big. Um, yes, rocket fist is exactly what I'm talking about. So this this is archery is very big, and this was shared like a hundred times, and I'm not sure if this is the positive attention we want. So we'll go through this list because some of these items are interesting, but most of it is fairly. Uh, crappy search results and I'm curious what you think as well you haven't seen it already so let's bring up the list it is the <laughs> the shit list uh, Morton um, I, I agree with you this time the the list itself is pretty crap um, the people on it not necessarily but the list itself is pretty badly made so let's go over to our list here so this is feed spot that's it feed post no feed spot so, top 30 YouTube channels to follow in 2018, last update April 6th. That was my update, and I'll mention that a bit later as well. So, this list, what does, it goes through 30 channels. Now, this is just bullcrap, by the way. All this stuff about um, total subscribers, views and uploads, quality consistency, search ranking, feed spot, editorial team objective, and subjective rival. Review that's bull crap by the way, it never happens. Hi, Jet. Um, Jet, rather, um, yeah, it's it's absolute bull, right? It, it, this is basically, um, it, it's it's basically it's not even search results, right? Because if you, I, I'll show you in a moment, right? Let's say, um, I, I'll bring up um, uh, YouTube search because if they legitimately searched up YouTube stuff. Then surely certain things appear. So, like, so let's do this very quickly. Let us now do a YouTube search for archery. Surely there'll be some interesting things which show. Oh look, it's me. Well, what did what do you know? Even Lancaster's there. Um, look, there's me. And uh, I'm not salty about this, but when you when you make a top thirty list of archery channels and you somehow miss me, then you clearly haven't searched. Uh, so, back to our list. So, those who've seen this know exactly how bad this is, but let's go through. So, it's basically, it's a pat on the shoulder uh, sort of thing. There's no, um, hey, my, my stuff's here. Latest archery videos. Okay, that's true. Um, yeah, like, there's, uh, the, the thing about this list, I, I keep sidetracking, but the thing about this list is that it's basically an automated process. There's no qualitative rank. It's not like we're getting, like, um, the top 10 experts or world archery, reviewing archery channels. It's just basically one guy who runs a search, um, but and then gets results. So, one, if you're not on this list, don't feel salty about it because it's really an unofficial list. It's not even like, an, uh, uh, again, this is not an authority. This isn't like Guinness World Records gives you like an award, right? This is just some random blog. Um, so, it is, there's, there's no fact behind this. So, the people who aren't on this list shouldn't feel bad. At the same time, the people who are on this list should not feel bad good and that's that's, that's that's actually what i don't like about um the way this is being treated Who, who's feed spot who cares about it and if you are on this list it shouldn't be something you're proud of all right anyone can make a top 10 or top 20 or top 30 but they can't just like 29 or 28 spots so they can't make a top 30 but people shouldn't feel bad or good about being this it's basically an arbitrary list let's go through it very quickly so we here we go we have world archery no surprise the largest art well, it's not it's not the largest archery channel um technically speaking Lars Anderson with the largest archery channel. <laughs> He's not on here. So World Archery is first. This is actually, I think it's a fair go, number one, because they do make most of the professional archery videos. I'm number two, but I wasn't here to begin with. Those who missed the drama. Um, so I, I made a joke post on Facebook about how, hey, you know, someone's missing. Where's Lars Anderson? And of course, people got the hint. And um, I think uh, the feed spot page um, kind of got flooded with a few... Um, I rate posts about people not being on there. There are quite a few more who should be on there but aren't. But, but, like the fact there was so much backlash in the first 24 hours, they edited the list to include me. And I'm surprised, but not surprised, about um, me being number two. That's pretty cool. It's nice to be recognized as number two, but at the same time, remember what I said about the rules? This isn't an official site in any way, so I give zero value to this thing. So most people would say, you know, number two, nice, but I actually don't care about this. I didn't expect to be on the list, um, I am, but by last minute addition. But nonetheless, 
that's the situation. So we are number two on the list. Apart from that, um, Grizzly Jim is number three. He used to be number two. I bumped into number three. And Three Rivers. I feel bad for Three Rivers because they made a uh, post saying, hey, we're top three. And then I jumped in and bumped them off top three. So this is making sense. I, I, I'm not sure about Three Rivers because they don't make a lot of uh, videos. They make um, like one a year or something. So they're very low profile. Um, Malta Archery. It's nice seeing Armin um, in here. I'm surprised he's on there. Not because he should or shouldn't be, but the, the reason why I think this is weird because all these channels have archery or some kind of archery term in their name. This is how they, um, they searched the channels. They didn't do a comprehensive search. They basically plugged in archery. I'm not sure how Armin got in um, because his channel does not have archery in the name. So why would uh, he appear? So this is actually curious. It's great that he's on there. He's doing a lot of stuff on thumb draw, which is good. If you don't like his videos, at least he's making them. He's got a good resource um, bank. Um, and hopefully he'll grow and he'll um, give a lot more uh, qualitative uh, information for those interested in different styles of archery. So he's there. Um, so that's a, that's a little surprise. Uh, yeah, the, his video production value could be a little better, but you know, we all start that way. Um, his, his demonstrations are good, but hopefully we'll see more from him. But uh, Knock on Archery, haven't seen much from them for the last uh, well, Hoyt, of course, business, Merlin, business, Lancaster, business. And look, the, these guys make, uh, Merlin makes some tutorial videos. They're not as much these days, uh, especially after Jim left. Um, they still make some previews and tips. Lancaster mostly does um, bow um, previews. I wouldn't say reviews, it's mostly previews. Business, archery tags are, you know, obviously, a, uh, I guess, a franchise now. Uh, bow tech is business. Average Jack, finally an actual archery YouTuber. Uh, Nate from uh, Archery, I'm uh, sorry, Average Jack. Uh, definitely check him out, by the way. Um, he is uh, making some good stuff at the moment. We'll just check him out very quickly. So he's making some good stuff on, on his channel. So uh, definitely check him out. He's worth there. Um, but again, it's surprising how it, we're, we're, draw, we're drawing some fairly new um, faces. Archer Supplies is a business in South Australia. The Push, that is one channel you definitely should check out for those who are doing traditional archery. Definitely check out um, The Push. Um, these guys should be much higher, I think. A lot of people started watching uh, with The Push. Not many videos, but excellent content from The Push. Um, Archery 101, Greg, and 3D Archery. Again, I'm surprised they picked up Archery 101, but not 3D. Same person, different focuses. Um, should check them both out. You, uh, again, official Archery channel. Sure shot, very small channel, but it's growing. Um, I remember back was much, much smaller, but he's making some stuff, some stuff there. Archery Attack is a Melbourne business. Surprised they're here. They've got um, some followers. Archery GB is the official uh, Eng uh, British um, archery organization. Borg Holder, uh, which I haven't seen before. Corbin's, that's an archery shop. Kings of Archery is, uh, I guess, a, a, a Dutch channel. Dead on Archery, Tribe Archery, uh, another business. Kanda Archery Online. Um, not sure what that is. Acubo is a single Kickstarter product. Surprised they made it. Oh, it's this guy. Yeah, um, yeah, this guy's interesting. Uh, I've just I said them already. Um, he's a guy who does stuff from um, Canada, obviously. Um, Chris Hill, um, probably one person making video form checks, and Archery Iceland. Hmm, ninety-seven followers. So that is the unofficial list. What happened there? So obviously. Obviously, this list should have no credit given to it. And I'm saying this because I'm number two, right? Don't trust this list because there are far more sources and far better sources than what you see on this list for archery. Um, I look, as, as much as we've talked about Lars Anderson, Lars Anderson. I mean, if you want to follow someone in 2018, Lars Anderson, you know, I'm sure he makes some good stuff at some point. But then we have, like, again, for, for me, um, when I started making videos, um, the top people would have to be Jeff Kavanagh, um, Archery Adventures, so Grizzly Jim. Uh, yeah, Grizzly Jim, Jeff Kavanagh, Grey Archer. Those guys were the pioneers of YouTube archery. Given that this list is a 2018 list, so it would make sense for someone like Grey Archer to not be included because he's no longer active. Um, but Jeff Kavanagh, I mean, he doesn't post a lot, but he deserves a lot of credit for what he does. Um, we have, uh, you know, Jimmy Blackmon, um, Arn Moe, you know, he doesn't make a lot of videos, but he, what he does upload, very useful. 
Archery Winchester. They don't make many videos these days, but some valuable resources. So it's a bit obvious because it's contentious. We're talking about channels which were pro more active like two or three years ago, not so much like in 2018 so far. So again, I'm not exactly sure you know, how you would measure this, but I'm curious. What do you think are the best archery channels to recommend to people now? Like the most current, relevant, um, most interesting, best production value, I don't know. Red Dragon, thank you, yes, I've got somebody. Red Dragon, very small, but he, he's one of the only people who puts in the effort to do um, historical discussions. So source analysis, he shoots um, different styles, so um, I, I like his stuff because it goes into more detail about the history side than what I, I do normally. Um, it's kind of like, you know, if we talk about the archery equivalent of other major history channels, I'd say Red Dragon is closer to, like, the Metatron of um, of archery. I mean, we talk about some really small-scale stuff here, but the amount of source analysis makes a bit more sense. Um, but, yeah, like, there are more people so who should be on this list or should be... We should make a better list than this, all right? So, you know, how about... Uh, let's, let's make a little pet project, all right? Let, let, let's let's um, compile what we think are some of the best archery channels that we would definitely recommend to people. Uh, I might do so next, but I might put a bit of a poll um, on my channel, my Facebook page. Um, so we'll see I don't know how we get with that one there. Um, there are a lot, there are so many different channels which cover every kind of archery from compound to primitive to, um, you know, Olympic style. So it's hard to really, you know, qualify for him. Um, is that Red Dragon? Shall I say? Let me grab the uh, link for you. It's not Red Dragon, it's Red Dragon. Um, and I'll link it in the chat uh, right now. That is his channel then. Uh, Billingsgate. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a good, good question. Where is Billingsgate? No, I'm a quick search of Billingsgate. See, he was a uh, very big back then as well. But there, 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 are, there are a lot of... Um, there are a lot of um, people who just disappeared off the the list. Uh, another thing, yeah, he's gone. Huh? Because the the thing to keep in mind is some of these um, uh, yeah, so, so some of these um, channels were basically not actual channels. They were like personal accounts, and it may be that they've closed or terminated their personal account, which means everything tied to it is down. But remember, there are. Um, YouTube channels. You actually have to be make a channel, and there are like personal channels which um, isn't named or branded. So um, you know, if you lose your personal account, you still have your actual channel uh, front. Um, and there are, there are tons more which I can't think of right now. Um, but yeah, so let's go. Let's go to our actual topic of discussion today. That was a, a bit of an interesting sidetrack, but uh, let's go to our actual topic. Uh, and by the way, knocking points. So Jeff from the knocking points worth watching. Um, but there are others too. Um, so, so let's talk to the, the topic today. The topic today, as you saw in the channel description and title, is draw weights, um, arrows, and plateaus. So what I did uh, today, I did a shoot. And I'll show you the score. I don't normally do this, but I'll show you what I got because it wasn't that great. So remember, I'm recovering from a form slump, and uh, I've been trying to break through a 50 rating. So I've gone from like a 40, 40 to a 45 rating, which is slow, to 50, 51, which is average. I want to get to the 60 because that's why I should be is the 60s in, in the Australian rating system. Uh, but I'm not. I was optimistic that today I get a 60, but uh, it was a windy day. Didn't quite get there. Uh, but what I did was this. So this is my scorecard from today. And this is the uh, Canberra or the uh, WA6900, which is an official world archery round. 60 uh, meters maximum, so 60 meters, 50 meters, and 40 meters, 90 arrows, so 30 arrows each. So um, in my first practice end, which uh, is not on this list, of course, it's a practice end, I actually missed a shot. I grouped really nicely 60 meters. And I'm actually really happy with the way I'm grouping. Uh, I'm not shooting poorly, I'm grouping fairly well, but I shot low and left, so I had to adjust my sight settings, and that's when I lost my first arrow. So the first distance, I bombed it, because my sight settings were completely off. I, I can't remember if I actually did a 60 sight setting with my current technique. I don't think I have, because my sights were completely wrong for the whole day. Um, my uh, Not only was my uh, elevation wrong, but my... 
um, windage was completely off. So instead of putting the ready the dot on the gold, I was aiming to the right of the target, like the white on the right. So that completely threw me off. Um, obviously, you know you have to shoot what you have in front of you. You can't say I'll oh, shoot me gold. I'll keep on shooting gold because I was actually missing the target at sixty meters. So I was going way off. I have to check my um my, my settings, my um my tune. So that's completely wrong there. Uh, but terrible um, start. The grouping was good, but not where it should be. So, uh, quick look here. Um, yeah, so the 60 meters was fairly mediocre. Um, I mean, we had some... I'm hitting gold, which I'm happy to. I've, I got uh, some decent ends, but it was a pretty floppy end. So mostly just 30s. 180 out of 300 is mediocre. Not great. Not horrible, but I could do better than this, especially on a big face at 60 meters. I started fairly poorly on the 50 meters, so I've got some nice golds there, but then we've got 555, and then the rest picked up. I've got one floppy shot, these things happen every now and then, but then things picked up for the last few ends. So this is not too bad, we're seeing more uh, golds and reds, and then at 40 meters, pretty happy with this. Um, again, the grouping's quite good. Uh, it was just gonna. I, I wasn't. I didn't have a solid reference point. I kept aiming off to the right, and I was trying to guess where it would be. And that's really the thing with your sight settings, right? If you don't calibrate your sight to be zeroed on that gold, you're introducing more steps, which you have to factor in your shot process, because you are. Going because normally, like you just go like it, that's your circle. Put the dot there, and that's your um your your shot, right? Just a line shoot, you hit gold. A line shoot, hit gold. Whereas if you have to aim off to the side, you have to remember how much to the side you are um aiming. It's like you it's basically gap shooting with a sight. That makes no sense. So, where possible, make sure that your sight is properly calibrated to shoot golds at all distances. If your windage is wrong at certain distances, then your tune is wrong. Something's bad. I mean, you might be arrows pointed the wrong way, might be too stiff. You can work around that, but ideally, get your tune so that you are shooting straight. Windage should only matter when you're actually you know, adjusting for wind. When there was some wind, but I was still aiming off far to the right. So I wasn't sure why. It might be my string picture change. Uh, it might be I'm anchoring slightly different, but I was way off. That threw me off. I was a bit unhappy about that. Um, I probably could have done better on that distance there. So um, the last distance, the last end, by the way, hilarious one. Um, I was doing well. Um, I, I actually had broken knock, so... I, I carry spare knocks in my quiver, so I replace the knock right away. And in doing so, it jinxed the arrow. This one here, this is my last shot of the day. And this one hit a white. I'm not sure why. At 40 meters, uh, it hit white. I am pretty sure that the arrow flipped up from the rest, went onto the plunger, and that's what caused the fly left. There are a couple of things which you can predict. If you shoot through the clicker, it normally goes low and right, assuming you're a right-handed archer, because low velocity, the clicker knocks it to the right, so it goes right. If it's high and left, that normally indicates something like the arrow not being on the rest properly. So that's what that was my fault there. Um, a little unhappy with the finish, but otherwise generally okay. Um, so my overall score of 900 was 646. Uh, average um, uh, per hour is about 7 point something. Um, it's okay. Not great. It's okay. I'm not unhappy with this. It's basically directly in line with the rest of my ratings so far. I probably could, I'm looking forward to a jump, I'm from like 51 to 55 to 60, I should be getting there, but it's nice to go through the motions, because these things will tell you what you need to improve, and this is the whole thing I do of plateaus, I'm plateauing, right, I've gone from like low to where it should be, so I'm pretty happy there, I want to see the next improvement, I'm currently plateauing, but every mistake that I make, 
uh, I will learn from that. So that's that's what I'm really happy about. It's just the fact that these things are. I'm shooting mediocre rounds, but I'm processing why these things happen. So next time I will have to check my tune, get my sight settings correct, so that next time I shoot the same round, I'm not aiming off like a meter to the right. So that would help normalize. Otherwise, technique seems okay. Was a little warm today, a little windy. Otherwise. Not too bad. Now, there are a couple more lessons I learned from this shoot here, which is the other focus of this video. Uh, so the first part was arrows. One thing which we remind people is to bring enough arrows for the competition. So normally, you would shoot six arrow ends. So every end, every you know, before, every round, I guess, or set, you shoot six arrows, you fetch them, and you shoot six arrows. That doesn't mean you bring six arrows. It means you bring 12, all right, or more than six, because you need spare arrows. It may be that an arrow has, you know, you, there's a problem, maybe a vein came off or a knock came off, and you can't fix it right away. So you can, you can use a spare arrow. Um, you might lose an arrow, you might break an arrow. So you need to have enough to keep it going. Now, one of our archers today, he uh, brought what seven arrows, uh, but he always misses, and uh, we'll talk about that a bit later. Wrong. This this is a draw weight issue, but he always misses, and you know when you're missing arrows, you can't search for arrows after every single end, and this is a one thing. I'm not saying this to discourage people, but if you're missing. Um, more than you know, ten percent of the time or twenty percent of the time, then maybe you shouldn't be shooting at that distance. In this case, our gentleman was shooting; he was missing like ninety-five percent, like off the target. So it was um, what should have been like a two-hour round took four hours because we spent every single end finding arrows. It's kind of frustrating, but it's a safety thing as well. Do be careful. We'll mention that later on. But in this case, because he was missing so many arrows, um, he didn't have enough arrows to shoot for the end. He had like seven to start with. He found one later, which had lost the previous day. So you have eight arrows, but he was shooting five arrows on average. Now, here's the thing, right? If you are shooting in a competition and you lose an arrow, what happens? That is up to the organizer. Now, in this case, there were three of us. I was the unofficial director of shooting, so I was kind of giving the, um, the organizational duty. So what I compromised was that normally when there's an equipment failure, then the shooter on the line can call the judge and explain what happened, and the judge can give the archer time to shoot at the end of the end. So in this case... Uh, let's say there was one arrow which had to be fixed. So it, basically, we can't hold the entire competition up. You shoot five arrows, and then you score, and then you shoot one more arrow, and you score that. And then you use that break time to fix your arrow. That's the idea. Now, we did that a, a couple of times. The thing is that we can't do that every single end because that would just increase the time to shoot by double nearly because you're basically running it twice so we can do it once or twice as a compromise if you especially if it's the last end of the distance before lunch or something that means you can find the arrow or get a new arrow before then but because um our gentleman shooter he lost an arrow like every he lost five arrows every end and only find like you know four then we couldn't stop and restart um, every single end. So basically, we had to accept that he had to shoot five arrows out of six, and he would automatically get a miss for his last arrow. That's how it works. It might, it might not be um, you know efficient for score, but it's unfair for everybody else because the whole thing, the whole line is waiting for one person to shoot and. If we can't, especially in a large event, now, there were three people in a casual club practice shoot, but this was a 100-person state championship, you can't hold the entire line. It might be okay once, but you can't make 100 people wait for one person who lost an arrow. So do you keep in mind that if you are going to shoot in a competition, bring enough arrows. Sorry. Um, so if you only have six 
you're pushing it because if you lose an arrow, then you're down one every single end. Um, okay, we can't actually um, get you to shoot separately. There have been some cases, again, we're, we're doing very informal stuff where someone turns up with five arrows and they shoot an extra end at the end. But it just, especially when you're scoring formally, you score cards and online scoring, you can't change the rules that much. Basically, and especially if you're starting out, if you only have six arrows and you're using one for bear shaft or you break one or you lose one, you can't shoot competition. And I know for my club, some people really bend over to make it possible for the new guys to shoot. So if you have four arrows, then we shoot three arrow ends or four arrows plus two more or something. But in a normal, formal structured environment, you can't do that. It's up to the archer. It is the responsibility of the archer to bring enough arrows to last the day. If you have six arrows and you don't lose a single arrow, fantastic, you're fine. But if you have six and you break one or you lose one, then you can't expect the organizers or the club or the event to stop because you had down an arrow. We can't bend the rules that much because other people have to shoot it as well. And again, remember this was this should have taken around two hours at most. It took us four and a half hours because we were searching for arrows and replacing arrows. It was a long shoot. Uh, Arnis, uh, 10 arrows at 6 arrow shoot, that's okay. Again, depends on your skill level, really, okay? So I normally, the, the main thing is, you want to have spare arrows in your quiver in case you can't do repair right away. The most common things are broken knocks or broken veins. Um, but, um, you know, things happen, all right? Um, th th there are things which you might cause, like if you hit the wooden frame and you break an arrow, that's kind of your fault, you need a spare arrow. But if there are things you can't control, um, there are things like, you know, a uh, vein that come, comes off, happens. Um, knocks break, you need to replace it or something, points loose. You just want to have a spare um, set of arrows while you that, that you can repair at the next opportunity. But 10 is okay. 10 is a pretty good number. I should be 7 or 8, but I've offered X10. I can't buy like one extra X10. I can buy 12 X10s. I can't buy one. So I may have to buy another set. So I'm down to six that I can use. One that's slightly damaged but usable, and one uncut, and plus one bare shaft. But I want to keep the bare shaft um, for tuning purposes. I don't want to you know, unfletch that every time. Okay, so that's the uh, second lesson. The, the, the last lesson, the first thing on this list is draw weights. Uh, I wanted to do a separate video, but I thought I'd mention it here. Guys, you've got to take it easy with your draw weights, okay? Um, the reason why is I mentioned the gentleman earlier who was shooting with us. Now, he is uh, 70 years old plus, okay? So the fact that he's made it to the range and shoot, shooting is fantastic. But I have to warn everyone. You have to be realistic about your draw weight. Now, uh, the thing about our, our gentleman is that he shot many years ago, like 20 years ago, before I was born. He's come back to shoot. But when you are 70 plus years old and you haven't shot for 20 years, you can't expect to shoot the same draw weight you were shooting when you were when you were a kid. Okay? I'm not saying this to be disparaging, but I'm saying this to be realistic because you risk injury, and more importantly, well, that's important too, but you can't shoot. And it was, it's just sad to watch um, our gentleman shoot because, you know, he'd be, he can't pull the bow back. You know, he's shooting a 35 pound bow, he's pulling it back, has no control. He's using a clicker, but he can't pull it through, and he pulls it through, he yanks, and he throws the bow out the side, um, or it collapses, so he stops using the clicker. Basically, and this is the sad reality is he he can't at 40 meters he missed 90 percent of his shots at 40 meters at 30 meters it might be half his shots it's actually really really bad and sad because you don't want to see people struggle that much in archery all right special people who are seniors people should be enjoying you know the the, the golden years who are enjoying um doing archery as a recreation and when you miss every single shot 
I, I, I'd be devastated. I mean, I'd probably quit before I did my next 10. I, I shouldn't be that bad. Um, but it's the, um, yeah, Rocket Fist has a point about the uh, obsession. But to me, this, this is a different point to make. Is that, for especially for an older person who hasn't practiced archery, you need to let go of the idea of shooting your favorite bow from, you know, 10 years ago. Because you might not be able to use it anymore. Um, and I, I, I just, I mean, it's, this, this particular bow is a one piece bow, so you can't change the limbs. It's an old fashioned bow, looks beautiful, would have been like the treasure, you know, when he had it years ago and he's still shooting it now. He wants to shoot it. But even if you are older, and especially as a senior shooter, you, need, you still need to have a plan to progress in draw weight. If you're getting back into archery, you can't just insert yourself at the previous point. You shot 50 pounds when you were 25 years old, you've taken 20 years off, you want to shoot again, you can't shoot 50 pounds. You, you have to go back to it. You're basically, you're, you're, you're regressing to the point where you were shooting as a beginner. So shoot 15 pounds, shoot 20 pounds, then come back up to your high draw weight. You can't just go, I shot it before, I'm gonna shoot it again. It just doesn't work that way. And it's just it's sad to watch. I actually feel really bad for him because if he shoots 20 pound and hits the target 100% of the time, that's a more satisfying feeling, a bigger achievement than missing the target 100% of the time, even though you're shooting 35 pounds. So that's my, my point about draw weight. Take it easy. Plan this. But this time, it's not about the young guys who are being gung-ho about draw weight. It's the older shooters who are coming back to archery. Because I've had quite a few people tell me about, you know, they, they did archery as a kid. They're now doing it after 50. They're now like 60, 70 years old, which is so great to see older people getting back into archery. But a lot of them are expressing that when I was young, I shot 40 pounds. Now I can't. So to buy lighter limbs. And that's fantastic. Because you're shooting again. But if you keep on insisting. That you're trying to shoot a 40 pound bow. Or 45 pound bow. Because you used to shoot it. Then it's going to be so painful to watch. It is so painful. Uh, how much uh, draw weight can be changed by the length? Not much. A change in the string length. That isn't meant to change the draw weight. You can change the like the velocity of the string. So, for example, if you have a very long string, therefore a low brace height, you will have a a longer power stroke. So you can increase the velocity arrow, and it will feel heavier. But the draw weight isn't affected by the string itself. Again, short brace height should mean more punch to the arrow. A longer brace height means the string doesn't go as far, so there's, there's less push on the arrow. But the length isn't what determines the draw weight. It's the limbs which do that. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I would love to see our gentleman um, shoot a lighter bow and hit the target and be happy with it. Uh, I'm not sure how much you know, someone can take by missing 100% of the time. Again, we can't ban it from a competition. But keep in mind too that in many clubs where you have to, you know, sign up for competitions, you have to prove that you can shoot at that distance. There might be a minimum requirement, like a qualification. So you need to score like, you know, out of 300, 200 or something to show you can hit the target. Because if you're missing that much, it becomes a safety issue. Um, that means arrows are missing. That means um, it just, it, it's not um, satisfying and it's not safe. So that's my, my reflection. Um, that's the formal part of my reflection. So okay, a couple of things there. Um, form plateaus are okay because it shows you what you need to improve. Um, the fact that you were doing regular shooting and regular training with scoring means you have some measure of progress. Okay, a lot of people who shoot archery will just practice and have no scoring. That's good because if you're training don't worry about score. You shoot the arrow, not the score. But at the same time, if you have no metric to measure yourself at all, how do you know you're getting better? Okay, Scores are... You can't dispute scores. You can always say that, oh yeah, I'm okay, I shoot fine, I group this much. Is it consistent? Do you always do so? And do you do so under pressure? Right. So if you're not doing that, if you have no score... 
you have no benchmark. You can't compare yourself to somebody else. You can't compare yourself to where you should be. So scoring is important. Try to do some kind of scoring if you actually want to measure how much you're improving. And especially when you're, it highlights what you need to fix. Number two, make sure you bring enough arrows to a competition. Bring spare parts like veins and knocks and definitely spare arrows because if you run out of arrows, then you're basically shooting with one or two fewer arrows, which will obviously impact your score. And number three, take it easy on the draw weight, especially with competitive shooting. Lighter draw weights are better. You have more control, and control, especially for a beginner to intermediate archer, control gives you points, not draw weight. Yes, high draw weights mean less wind drift, flatter arc should be more accurate, but if you can't control it, then there's no point in having a high draw weight. Shoot a low draw weight, control the shot. Yes, it'll float off you know, away, but at least you can hold the damn bow. If, and especially as an older person in your 60s and 70s, you need to consider your physical condition. If you don't stay fit and you don't practice, then you will find that you won't shoot the way you did as a younger person. So you need to let go of that um, that that obsession with shooting a high draw weight, especially as an older person, because you can't do what you used to do. So that is my reflection. So I will now take some questions. Uh, we'll stick around for maybe 10 more minutes. I don't want to take too long, but let's see how we are going at the moment. I've seen a few questions. Um, to make it easy for me, please tag me in the, uh, the question that I can see um, the stuff at the moment. Mm. It's autumn right now. Temperatures, it's basically cold nights, but it's been quite warm for the past couple of days. So it's kind of been up and down for the, uh, um, the temperature. I wasn't feeling very well this morning. I had some, um, you know, lung coughing thing happening, so kind of affected me, but um, can't blame that. Okay, so uh, let's see some questions. Uh, Luigi, hello. Uh, do you have any tips for someone who doesn't have an archery club anywhere near his town? Depends on what you want to do. If, if, if you just want to do archery, you don't need a club. A club helps, but you don't need a club to do archery. Um, where possible, get guidance. As of learning anything, um, the more guidance you have, the easier it is to learn something. There are, it's a safer path where you, you're not relying on what, feel, what you think feels right. You can trust an expert to show you. So where possible, get some guidance. Um, if you can't do it in person, next best thing, um, books and online resources can be good, but it's a bit riskier. So in my opinion, having someone actually teach you is the best way to learn. Um, using sources from other people who know what they're doing is second best. And just figuring out by yourself is the worst way. It can still work, by the way. People can shoot if they teach themselves. But as of a lot of things, being self-taught opens you up to a lot of errors, which are chronic. You know, I, I'm a self-taught pianist, and I play like crap. Right? I'm not going to perform in a concert anytime soon. My style, at best, is barbaric. All right, I might play some piano sometime for you guys, um, but I, I don't have the fundamentals. I skip the foundations. I play music, which I like, and there's no reason for me to not enjoy. I really enjoy playing what I can play, but I don't have the foundation to expand my skills greatly. So that's my general advice is, where possible, get some professional guidance. Okay, yeah, Rocket Fist is a point there. Uh, for those who are kind of measuring your draw weight, I mean, there are things like, you know, hold the bow for 30 seconds and so on, but the question really is, can I shoot my last arrow as well as my first arrow after three hours, after 144 arrows? And today I did, so I was quite happy with that. Um, I didn't feel like I was having... Um, issues with my draw weight. Uh, often that is a problem, but I am okay with that. Um, I think my conditioning is getting better. My shoulders are kind of I've got like square shoulders now, so I feel pretty good about it. Um, but I, uh, I I felt pretty stable all the way through. 
I don't feel like I'm stressing myself. I feel like I'm control. But for others, you need to remember that you sh you're shooting long days. Okay. All right. Uh, what else talking about here? How is my horseplay practice? I'm not doing it as much. Can I post videos? Yeah, I, I actually don't mind posting videos. Um, I, I want to. Right? I, I, don't, I don't really practice it enough, but I'm casually practicing. I mean, I, I have a thing right now at my club. Because I have so many bows, um, I'm trying to kind of cross-train to maintain motivation so that when I shoot my Olympic rear curve, I still have the conditioning. But I'm not like overdoing it where I'm getting bored of my one style. So we have Trad Tuesdays and we have Thumb Draw Thursdays. And that's for me, right? So on Tuesdays, I shoot Longbow, I shoot Trad Recurve. And on Thursdays, I shoot Thumb Draw. Thumb Draw Thursdays. Pretty cool. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm getting more used to the draw way. I'm not anchoring very far back, but I'm anchoring the point where I, I feel the fletchings along here. So if my fletchings are here, that's probably my best point. There. I, I'm not going any further back. I probably could. I'm going to try a longer draw than we're currently doing. But um, not something I'm very much used to at the moment. But I'm um, really enjoying it right now. But uh, yeah, I, I don't film a lot because one, um, on my training days, I don't normally bring my camera because the priority is training. Um, this is why I guess I'm a little different from a lot of YouTubers. I'm not content driven. I, I, I actually do draw a line. For me, if it's personal training, which I have to do, then I'll do that first. Um, if, if, I'm being, if I'm coaching somebody else, that takes priority. I'm not going to film myself unless I have nothing else to do. So I'm not trying to be an egotist and say, look at me shoot, look at me improve my horse, but look at my style. That's, that's not the point. I'm, I don't care. But I mean, I could get a thousand views, get paid 10 bucks or something, but... That's not why I do things. I want to make content which you want to watch, um, not stuff which is just glorifying what I do, which isn't that exciting for me anyway. Um, that's why I don't film a lot of practices. Um, the, if I do film a practice, I want to actually focus on something rather than just film me just do a casual practice. Um, but most of the time when I'm coaching people, I don't have time to set up a camera and film myself shoot, especially now that it's um, um, nearing winter. I've just hit daylight savings. So we, I have got to, I've got to run like, an hour after work before the, the, the sun goes down. So I have very little time to shoot, let alone do filming. So that's something I can do, but not what not I want to do a lot. But good question there, Arnest. Thank you. Um, where was I? So, that, 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 that's, it's saucy. I'm just asking something else. So that's, that's the saucy question. Uh, what are those Arnest's question? The outlets? Um, these ones over here, right? So, uh, now that you ask, um, this one is the broadband cable. Uh, we, Australia rolled out the NBN, or the National Broadband Network. And that basically replaces all broadband networks that were previously in place. It's basically an infrastructure upgrade. It's meant to be faster. Meant to be. In some cases, mine is. Um, especially upload. That's been a, a, an amazing thing. The reason why I can do this is my upload speed is actually sane, so I can live stream. Um, so that's the um, NBN. This one down here is my former broadband connection. So my broadband goes through this wall. My modem is um, well over there, and this is my router. So that that's where it, that that's basically my, my internet connection over there. In case you're wondering, <laughs> good question. I guess didn't really think about that, but good question. Uh, P. Mole, um, you want to start archery again, can I still use my 20 year old bow? Depends on what your bow is. If it's a target metal recurve, then you still could. But if it's a wooden bow, you need to check if it's still safe. Like, wooden bows tend to crack, um, so you need to, you get it checked out um, before you use it. It doesn't mean you can't use it, but it depends on how well you've stored it. Um, yeah, Chung said, Telecom, yeah, it's a broadband connection. Sebastian, I have a draw length of 31 inches and I have problem finding arrows of around. That, that's tough, actually. Um, yeah, the best thing is find arrows which do come. Uh, you, you have long arms. That's a, uh, that's that, This is one case where having short arms is not a bad thing. Um, you know, basically find arrows which are 32 inch. Um, don't have any tips for you there. 
Uh, thoughts on pre-draw and setup, Molten? Good question. Um, the point of the setup position is basically to get your alignment before you start shooting. That's the principle. Now, some people will still get this right even without a setup position. The point of pre-draw is, is to guarantee you start in the right position. Um, I didn't learn a setup position. Uh, I learned pre-draw. I didn't learn setup, so if, the, these definitions will fluctuate depending on who you ask. But to me, the setup position is before you lift the bow, so you set your shoulder down and you kind of put some tension on the string, and then you bring the bow up and you draw back. Pre draw, at least the way I was taught, which is an older system, is when you lift the bow up and then you draw back. That's basically it. Now, is it important? I think, I think it's important, but not essential. But a lot of people will basically acquire the right alignment without that process. But the point of teaching extra steps is to make sure the steps are there first. When people become experienced and natural, they can skip steps. It's like with things like mathematics, where you learn every step to, to um, get the solution. But when you get better, you tend to skip steps. Though when you start skipping steps, you start making mistakes and you don't realize it. I think the same thing applies to um, things like the archery shot process steps. Things like setup and pre-draw aren't essential, un unessential rather, but if you skip these steps, you may find that there are form faults which creep in that you don't recognize because you've become accustomed to doing the things in a different way. So that's my general comment. That is... You don't need it, but if you don't use it, you risk forming mistakes in your process, which you can't sense. That's basically the reason why. Um, I mean, again, I don't use a setup position. I probably should. And when, especially when I'm shooting poorly, I'll be more conscious about using a set position before I shoot. Um, I don't really put the bow back when I shoot, by the way, but that, that helps a lot too. So, um, a lot of it depends on how you've been trained, uh, but it's not, I think it's important to understand why it's done. It's not always essential to do it, but if you're not shooting well, you, you need to explore the options rather than cut yourself off from other options. Okay, uh, Chunk, uh, out, it's, it's night time here, guys. So, you can see outside, there's just nothing there. It's night time. So, you basically see a reflection in my room, so nothing too important there. Um... Where are we? Next question. <laughs> yeah, stalk new center. Yeah, no, you probably find my um, you know, serial number somewhere on my broadband and find me. But it's not hard to kind of you know find who I am. Um, do I know? Oh, good, good question, Kevin Od Odia. Uh, do you know in historic archery duels? Good question. Um, I don't. I mean, there there, there are legendary stories. All right. Uh. Uh, yeah, you know, I guess yeah, the the legendary um, uh, Indian you know kind of myths are there. Uh, I'm pretty sure there are some Japanese samurai you know stories or so whatever. But I don't know if there's a duel. There's normally there are a lot of competitions where like one person will outshoot somebody else. A uh, good example. Look at say the Three Kingdoms of China. Uh, Lu Bu. Everyone loves Lu Bu, um, unless you're facing him at uh, Pulau Gate. Um, at level one, um, Lu Bu, good story. He you know throws his halberd, sticks in the ground, and then he shoots the shaft with his arrow with his bow. So there are lots of stories of feats of individual skill, and it may be feats of skill against somebody else. But an actual duel, these things aren't very romantic. And this is the thing with um historic archery duels. The answers probably no. The answers probably I I can't name any. They are probably there, but it's again the archery legend and myths are normally about archers competing against other archers, not actually dueling each other. You find duels with swords and spears all the time, but with bows, not so much. If you know any, post them because I'm not. I can't answer this question. I actually don't know. We accused the winning historic archery duels, but most of the time, because in archery was not that important. Okay, for the for the majority of people, archery was just a hunting tool. It wasn't necessarily a sign of skill. Like if you can bring home meat and not starve, then you're fine. It's not like you know you have the heroes you know using bows against each other because mostly the duels are feats of like masculinity of strength. And that's shown through, you know, hand-to-hand, -hand, you know, man-to-man, uh, -man, hand-to-hand. 
that's kind of what you're looking at. So that mostly means melee, swords, spears, shields, armor, unarmored wrestling. That's more of a of a manly duel. Whereas with bows, bows have traditionally been seen, especially in European societies, as cowardly, and especially even in like in a lot of um, warrior cultures or aristocratic um, levels. I mean, the bow is important, but a true uh, warrior should be able to fight hand to hand. That's Tradition has always been so. I don't think there are many stories of archery duels per se. Um, so I don't think that's a, a really common thing that I, that, that I can name at the moment. All right. Okay, where are we? Uh, I mean, tr okay, sorry. Uh, rocket fist. Yeah, the 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 the, the, the African tribal clashes. Not really duels. You know, it's just you know people flinging arrows at each other. They actually are legitimate you know clashes. Not really dueling though. In a sense where you have like one hero versus another hero, one champion versus another champion. Uh, EXE Archery. I haven't heard of that before. What is EXE Archery? Google. EXE Archery. Oh, EXE. Lancaster supplies it. Alright, let's have a look here. EXE. Let's have a quick look. What, what do they make? Make knocks and sight apertures? Is that it? And a stabilizer? Uh... The they make bows, do they? So, all, all I'm seeing are cases. Is that a bow? That's not a spree cup case. Uh, it's just a bow. Okay, I see a bow. Okay, alright. This doesn't seem to be a very popular, well-known brand. What is that? So I haven't looked at these things right now. So I'm looking at the uh, quick Google search. Bink. Let's have a look. So let's have a look at some of these things. So, okay. Okay. I'm guessing it's mostly based in Europe, right? I'm not, I'm not sure where this is. That seems to be a fairly basic beginner level bow. And this one seems to be the next level up. It's actually not a bad bow. Uh, I can't say if it's a good brand. It looks like a Hoyt. Honestly. Uh, so just from the look of the riser, I don't see a problem with it. It looks like a Hoyt Horizon. Um, just the 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 style of the uh, the uh, I pointed to my screen. I actually made the point of this. So um, yeah, it looks like a Hoyt. Um, the 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 badge looks very Hoity. The um the design looks like a Hoyt um Horizon or Hoyt GMX. So I I think it's fine. I, I don't see a problem. With it. I think same price range. Uh, so EXE looks okay. Uh, I don't, I haven't used it, but it seems fine to me. Uh, good question then. Next, uh, David Wood. I've been shooting club bows since October. Started at twenty pound and moved to twenty six pound in February, and have no issue shooting two to three hours. I'm thinking thirty two pound for my first Olympic record. What do you think? I think it's fine, um, especially if you've shot twenty to twenty six. 32 you have progression now normally we recommend like a four pound increase at max six pounds pushing it but 32 pound is well within reason for your for your cap for your physical ability if you go from 32 to 40 that's harder so as you get higher the poundage increase shouldn't be as high whereas if you're starting low you can jump from 25 to 30 and you're probably okay if you jump from 35 to 40, or 40 to 45, it gets a lot harder. So I think 32 would be quite a reasonable draw weight for you, um, considering you've been shooting since last year. So I think 32 should be alright for you. And I'll go with Rocket Fist as well. Most people can handle 32. Again, most people is not a good excuse. Um, I'll, I'll share out that. So one of my um, current uh, new members and fellow shooters, um, he... Bought himself like a 32 pound bow, knowing that it's an Olympic style, most people can handle it. But what I've diagnosed in training him, and he'll be happy to admit this too, is that he has absolutely no upper body strength. His technique, his form, his strength is really weak. Um, he, 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 he was shooting my 25 pound bow, and he was struggling with back tension, he was struggling with form. Um, we dropped him down to 15 pound, which is our junior bow. And he was just getting it right. So if he jumped straight to um, 32 pound, I think he would have put himself in a very bad situation. Not of injury, 
but just never shoot in good form because you can't if you can't handle a light bow correctly, you can't handle a medium bow correctly. So I think I we say thirty pound is an economic choice, but you need a pathway. If you can't if, if you already are a fit person, it shouldn't be that hard to shoot thirty pound. But many people and when you teach beginners, this is what you see. When you show, when you look at like other archers, most people start at thirty pound. That's why I feel that when people say thirty pound is a starting point, we're being biased towards people who are already archers. Because I run an archery club where we train first timers, my perception of the average person is much different. There are many people, if they took up archery seriously can shoot really well on 25 pounds for the next three or four months. If they start with 30 pounds, they're gone. All right. And again, when you see people shoot heavy draw weight, it just feels so agonizing seeing them struggle because you know that if you um, give them a five pound lighter bow, they'll be shooting golds. But because they're shooting five pounds too high, they're shooting like crap. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Not very cool. Um, let's see. What else do we have here? Ah, yes. Uh, archery enthusiast. Who I imagine is an archery enthusiast. Um, obviously a video on front shoulder position. Uh, yes, that's a good point there. I might do a video on that at some point. I, I, I wanted to do another video about pain. The thing is that my archery injuries video covered all that already um I, I wanted to make a new video i might do it anyway but everything i wanted to say i've already covered in my own video so i didn't actually mean to do that uh so but there you go um I, it's not like there's a lot to say which i haven't already said uh but that, that's something i might keep in mind next time yeah the mahavarabharat is what i was thinking of um with the legendary duels um i can't really think of anything about other than that um and i think that is it last questions guys we've got about two minutes Last calls for questions. And then it's back to either Sleep or Far Cry 5. One of those two. <laughs> sleep or Far Cry. What should I do? I will be doing a video on Far Cry 5. There have been quite a few uh, changes um, to archery, which make it a lot more interesting. One of the big changes I found is basically bullet drop. I mean, arrows in Far Cry always had drop, but um, the the bullets now have travel time in Far Cry 5, so um, it's really satisfying. I also noticed that the arrows basically are more for a... I mean, this, this, the slingshot makes a difference. Compound, but not so much, but the slingshot makes a pretty big difference. So we're covering that. Um, there's, there's quite a few changes, which I find, I find is very good. Though, I have more fun using silence, like, you know, rifles rather than bows. But bows are still very fun to use, still very practical. We'll be covering that at some point in the next um, week or so. How does one overcome the itch to buy a Nano TFT? A... If you, if you just don't have the money, you know, then you can't buy one. That's the only suggestion I have, is somehow remind yourself that you don't have money. <laughs> Okay, oh, um, how many arrows should you be able to shoot and not be tired? 150 in three hours. Um, that, that's, that's it. Uh, I mean, in a competition, you're shooting 150 arrows, roughly. So you should be able to shoot your 150th arrow the same when you shoot your first arrow. So if you can't do that, if you're running out of gas by halfway, then you're overbowed, basically. I mean, even for me, I, I would, I, I'm gonna, one of the videos I'll be doing it very shortly, I'm going to actually show you, show you of me shooting um, a light bow to, from 15 to 50 pound. So you can see physically how different it is when you handle different bows. Now, I'm an average person. I don't shoot heavy bows. But you will see why draw weight matters. When you see me shoot a 15 pound bow, it looks absolutely perfect. 50 pounds, I'm barely drawing back to my anchor point. So the big point there is, um, yeah, you have to control the shot process. Um, exercises, look up SPTs, 
Kasich Lee's SPTs. There are four exercises. I'm going to do a video on this. If people keep asking me, I will do a video um, to show you how to use a bow for strength exercises. Um, otherwise, um, bent over rows are pretty good. Um, Push-ups to a lesser extent. But um, the best way is to use the bow itself. It's tedious training, but you use, hold the bow and practice using it like using weights. You know, I, I, I do it. Look it up. SPT is what you want to look up. I will do a video on that at some point in the future. Because people keep asking me. Okay, I reckon that's it. It is now 12.30, uh, past midnight, of course. So that's my reflection. We'll be doing our, um, we'll be doing our Q&A in probably two weeks. Uh, so if you have any archery questions, I'll answer those in more detail later. But that's my reflection video. So uh, I will happily uh, uh, sign off. Uh, last question, Hattori1. Um, if you're having trouble getting arrows from your uh, foam brick, then what you should do is get some arrow lube or arrow lubricator. It's basically lubricant, so it's easy to get the arrows out of foam. That's why you need it, the arrow lube. Anyway, that's it for me, guys. Thank you very much, and I will see you all next time.